verse that we've been using is our uh, introductory verse. It hasn't changed. Um, Isaiah 9, 6, and right there in the middle there it says, and his name shall be called. We're going to start there. I'm actually going to have you turn now. Uh, go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And as you turn there, we'll run through the introduction. And the introduction has one change, one addition to it, which is Acts chapter 4. Um, the introduction is the same as it has been. Um, God describes himself using many names and titles and many, 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 many names and titles. There's, there's a, a lot of them. And that's what we've been talking about. This is less than 13. Okay, so th there's a lot of them. And all these names have uh, very specific meanings. Even if in the language of the time, or as we look at it now, it's kind of a general term, it has a specific meaning in the application that we see in regards to the, to the names and titles of Christ. Um, and each of these names adds more to our understanding, more detail. Helps us to to get a more clear picture of who God is, which is important because we are worshiping an incomprehensible God. We can't understand him completely. And so any, any info that we can get is helpful. Um, and these, uh, these show relationship. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, um, especially today's. Uh, they show relationship. And then Acts 4.12, if you're there, um, We'll read just a couple of verses. Uh, verse 12 is the, the focus here, but we'll start in verse 10. Um, Peter's preaching. Uh, Peter says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified. Now, let's pause right there. That wasn't not a part of the lesson here, but um, Peter doesn't say by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and then continue on. He sticks that knife in and turns it. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified. He makes sure that they know who he's talking about here. Then look, whom God raised from the dead. Even by him does, doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone. Oh, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? This was the stone which was set at naught of the builders. We saw that the, this was the, the stone that the builders refused. Which has become the head of the corner. We talked about the, the chief cornerstone. And then look at verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name. None other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So Peter, as he's giving this sermon before the council, this is like before the Jewish leaders, uh, focuses right here on the name of Jesus Christ. And as he does, he use a, uses a couple of these other titles to very clearly identify who he was. This is not Jesus Christ. This is Jesus of Nazareth. This is Jesus that God raised from the dead. This is Jesus who's the foundation stone, the chief, cor the chief cornerstone. I mean, he makes it very clear who he's talking about and what is the relationship between Jesus and God. And as a result of that, the relationship between Jesus and the Jews. And so today, uh, we're going to dive in. We're going to look at son. Now, this may... Even if we finish the, the lesson that, we have, that I have for today, this may go over to the next one, because there's more son titles than I could do in one lesson. Um, I got all of this in, and every time I went to look something up, there was another, let's say, derivation of, I'm like, holy cow, people. Uh, there's a bunch of them. And so we may have more son next week. We'll see. That is the plan at the moment. Uh, but son, um, in trying to uh, keep everything so that it fit on the pages the way I wanted, um, some, of the, some of the notes, now it's, it works well here where I've got uh, two passages and they're lumbered one and two. Um, some of the ones coming up just to give you warning before we get there. If you're one of those that needs everything right in order, um, I may have two passages on one line, trying to squeeze everything in the way I needed it. Uh, John chapter 3, turn there if you've not already. I hear pages turning, so some of you are already headed in that direction. John chapter 3, uh, familiar passage, a couple of different titles that we see today are found in this passage. Uh, 
Jesus is doing the speaking. Here he's speaking to Nicodemus. If you look at verse 1, um, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. So he comes and he has questions, and he's coming in the dark of night. Uh, if you have a red-letter Bible, you'll see that Jesus answers some questions. Nicodemus has some questions. Jesus answers some questions. Nicodemus has a question, and then Jesus answers more questions. Okay, so it's, it, 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 this is dialogue, plain and simple. Um, look at verse 17. We'll get to 16 later. Look at verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay, go to the end of the chapter. Uh, verse 36. Now, if you have a red-letter Bible, yours may not be read here. Mine's not. Because if I look back up a little bit, it talks about John giving testimony of Jesus. So, different speaker, same topic. Look at verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So the title that we see here is just simply Son. Now, everything after this is blank son or son blank, okay? But here is just son. And this, the, the meaning here is pretty simple. It's son or a man or a male child. I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, just some simple thoughts, uh, and that's what we have today. We don't have l lengthy thoughts on any of these, and they're not real profound. But hopefully they're thoughts that will get you to think and maybe run with some of these. Um, uh, first of all, God doesn't physically have a son. And yet, when we look at Matthew and Luke, Mary bore Jesus, and it says that the Spirit of God will come upon you. So, it makes my head hurt. How does all this work? But God doesn't physically have a son. Uh, the title here is used to show relationship. Let me think back to the introduction, we talked about that. And understand that Jesus is not subservient to Jehovah. Jesus is God. And the Father is God. And we serve one God, but there are three persons who make up this. Again, uh, man has never been able to explain the Trinity. He comes up with all sorts of uh, illustrations, but they all fall short somewhere. All of them together, again, help us to understand it a little bit better. But it's a little bit better. But this is Son. Jesus is the Son. Um, staying with the idea of Son, that's all of them today. The Son of David. The Son of David. And here we find uh, where I've got passages where there are a couple of them lined up here. Um, go to Matthew. Go to Matthew 15. We'll go to that first one there. Matthew 15. And verse 22, we'll look at that one, and then we'll go to the Revelation passage, I guess. Matthew 15 and verse 22. Um, woman of Canaan came out of the uh, same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Thou son of David. And then we go to the end of the text of Scripture. Go to Revelation 22. And verse 16, 22, 16. Now, this one, if you have a red-letter Bible, this one may be red. Look at the first two words, I, Jesus, so you kind of know who's speaking. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. It doesn't say son of David there, but you understand what it says, okay? I am the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So Jesus says that he is the son of David. Uh, the meaning here um, is literally that Jesus is the direct descendant of David. If we go to the genealogies, Matthew and Luke, when they give the genealogies, one, uh, a part of the genealogy, they both are identical. And then one goes through Joseph's line, one goes through Mary's line, but in both cases, it shows that he is a direct descendant of King David. So he was literally a, a son of David. But that's not what it means when he says that he's the son of David. He's talking about the fact that he is the Messiah. And we see that 
when we look through the Gospels, and he uses the term in the Gospels because the audience was Jewish, and they understood clearly when he said that he was the son of David, they wanted to kill him. Well, why would they want to kill him if he was simply saying that, hey, David was one of my forefathers? There were a lot of them that could say David was one of the forefathers. You go back in the Old Testament, you see, David had more than one wife. He had lots of kids. And as generations go and in the, in the family grow, there were a lot of them that could have said. That's not all he was saying. He was saying that I am the, 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 the son of David. And they're like, oh. He said he was the Messiah. We looked at a passage in Matthew. We looked at a passage in Revelation. Go back to Matthew. Go to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Matthew makes it pretty clear here. Looking at genealogy, the very beginning of the gospel, the very beginning of the gospels, the very beginning of the New Testament. As God inspires Matthew to write, and God works on the people who put the books in the order that they put them in, look at what the very first verse in the New Testament says. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The title is used right there, and that, that name identifies him to a T. He was physically a descendant of King David, but he was far more than that. He was the promised son of David. So we've got son, we've got son of David, we've got son of God. Son of God. Uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And verse 34. Um, we were in this chapter just a couple of weeks ago. If you want to dive, uh, look back just a couple of verses, look at verse 29. John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God. So we were in this passage just a couple of weeks ago. Um, here we see um, in verse 34, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now that's interesting. Here's John, highly esteemed prophet, greatly respected and hated, depending on which side you were, one who had an incredible impact, one who was the very forerunner of the Messiah, one whom God used to baptize Jesus Christ. And here's John, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Um, let's look at two more. Uh, go to Galatians 2. Galatians chapter 2. And verse 20. Galatians 2.20. Paul's writing here. He says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here we have this incredibly powerful passage, and Paul, as he's writing under the inspiration of God, of all the names and titles that he could choose, he's inspired of God to use by the faith of the Son of God. And go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We find two titles used here. 1 John 5 and verse 12. He that hath the Son, when we just looked at, hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And we'll see that thought throughout here. Well, the Son of God. Uh, passages, uh, meaning here. First of all, Christ is of the same nature as God. Um, while DNA identifies individuals, there is a commonality in the DNA between relatives, incredibly between father and son. He has the same nature as the father. Indeed, he is God. Christ is not merely a man. He is the son of God. And I think I added it in here, not right there. Um, 
maybe not, I don't remember. Um, yeah, I did. So I'm going to make a, a comment here, and it will show up actually in the, in the next one as well. Um, when we go back and study history and we get to Greek and Roman mythology, and you think back to Zeus and Jupiter and all the Greek and Roman gods, all of their gods had different human frailties. Not Jehovah God, not Jesus Christ. There were no human frailties there. He is the son of God. He's not merely a man. Um, and he's the son of God, and God has a unique love for Jesus Christ. Think of father to son, father, father-son relationship. There's a unique love there. And again, we'll see that as we go through this. There's some of the other titles and names that we'll see here. Um, go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, as we dive into the thoughts here. Um, we saw Matthew 1.1, the very first statement within the New Testament. Hey, this is the genealogy of the Son of God. Of the Son, excuse me, the Son of David. Um, look here, Acts 9 and verse 20. If you look a little bit earlier, this is the conversion of the Apostle Saul, Apostle Paul, Saul as he's traveling. Okay? The conversion of Saul. And uh, verse 19, when he had received meat, he was strengthened, and he was there in Damascus for a, a number of days. Look at verse 20. The very beginning of his preaching ministry, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Why was Saul, Paul, on the journey to Damascus to begin with? Because these heretics were preaching that Jesus Christ was risen, that he was God's son. When he comes to Christ and is converted, what is the core of his preaching? That Jesus Christ is the son of God. And there is a radical change in his life instantaneously. Again, he was not a dumb man. He was one of the most brilliant minds of the age. And when he was converted, it wasn't like he lost all that brilliance. He simply saw the truth and saw it for the first time. And when he saw the truth and understood it, it simply changed his mindset. And now he's preaching that Jesus Christ is indeed the very Son of God. And this idea is important. Uh, Jesus as the Son of God is, is paramount to the Christian. Those who deny the deity of Jesus Christ... Not to be rude, crude, or mean, but they cannot get into heaven. We already saw. There is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. What was it about that name? He is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. If you don't accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God, uh, you've got a big problem, an eternal problem. It's important that we understand that Jesus Christ as God's Son is paramount to the Christian faith. So we see the Son, we see the Son of Man, the Son of David, the Son of God. Let's look at the Son of Man here. Get them out of order a little bit. The Son of Man. Uh, go to, let's just go to the first one here, Mark, Mark 14. Um, Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. And verse 62. Now, this is an interesting passage, again, uh, today pointing out some of the red letter stuff here. If you have a red letter Bible, this is a single red letter verse in the midst of a black letter passage. Let's see why this red letter verse comes in. Look at verse 61. He held this peace, answered him nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man... Now, let's read the rest of the verse, then I'll make my comment. See the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of, the, of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Look at the question that was asked. Are you the Son of the Blessed? Jesus says, I am the Son of Man. He says, he says I am, but he shifts that title just a little bit, which is uh, intriguing to me. Rather than, again, like we saw earlier when uh, Peter was preaching and he said, uh, oh yeah, that Jesus of Nazareth, the one that you crucified. Okay, and he's to, Jesus here changes around a little bit. He's, he's driving home a point. Um, we've got the, the, a couple of passages here. I'm not going to turn to the others. Uh, 
First of all, Jesus often used this particular title in connection with his rejection, his sufferings, his resurrection. He used it in connection with the troubles and trials that he was going to face. He was the son of man. And again, I mean, I don't have a lot of profound, just thoughts that kind of start you to thinking. Um, his, th this title here kind of shows he understands us. He knows what we're going through. Uh, the Bible talks, Paul, as he wrote, says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You know what, the things that I'm going through, uh, other people endure too. But then it says that there's a way of escape. Well, what is that way of escape? That way of escape is through Jesus Christ. Okay? He understands what we're going through. The Bible says that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He understands us, understands what we're, what we're struggling with, what we're going through. He's the son of man. Um, go to Matthew 25 as we look at thoughts again. A couple of passage times uh, through this lesson here where there, the thought has another verse, an additional verse in it. Matthew 25, verse 31. Let's see if I have the right verse. I'm not sure that, uh, let's see, 25, yes, okay. Uh, if you have a red-letter Bible, this is red letters in the midst of a very lengthy red-letter passage. And he's writing here, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the angels, holy angels with him, then he, uh, shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Son of Man, title used, not talking about his sufferings and rejections. Talking about, hey, after all that, you reject me, guess what? I'm going to be sitting right next to, right next to the Father. Uses that same title, but looking at end of the story. The Son of Man will return in his glory. Um, here's the other comment. This is the, the Son of Man title. The Greek gods. And all their Greek gods with all their, their human frailties that they had to deal with. Um, and you go back and, and... And I enjoyed Greek mythology. I enjoyed the stories. But you've got to understand their stories. Reading Greek mythology is not the same as reading the Old Testament. Reading about the Greek gods does not line up with reading about the God of the Jews. The God of the Jews is the one true God. The stories that we read in the Old Testament are stories of actual events. Uh, if you're watching a Sometimes you'll be watching a movie on TV, and at the beginning it'll say, based on a true story. What does based on a true story mean? It means that they had a thought, they took that thought and ran with it. That's not what happened here. As we look at the scriptures, this is not based on a true story. This is a true story. Huge difference. And we need to understand that. And then similar to what we saw just a moment ago, uh, Christ understands what we're going through. He is the Son of Man. He understands. And as he understands us, he gives us the grace and mercy that we need to go through this life. Think of the, the old spiritual. Nobody knows the troubles I've had. Okay? But there is somebody that knows. Jesus Christ knows. And he gives us the grace, he gives us the mercy that we need to go through this life. And life, you can have a great, fantastic day. And the next day could be a complete 180. And some of us have, uh, have encountered that, right? Or maybe you have bad day after bad day after bad day, and your hope is that maybe tomorrow will be a good day. There are people that struggle in life like that. Christ knows what we're going through. As the Son of Man, he knows. And so we have the Son, the Son of David, the Son of God, the Son of Man. Uh, we have him as the Son of the Highest. The Son of the Highest. Um, some, some translations translated this one, the Son of the Most High. I mean, the, the Most High, the Highest. It, you take your superlatives, it says the same thing. It's just interesting that... He is the son of that one. Narrows the entire discussion to one. Go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke 
Luke 1, 32. The angel comes and is foretelling what shall happen here. Um, uh, verse 32. Talking about Jesus. Uh, talking, to Mar- talking to Mary in verse 30. Uh, the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Um, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Uh, verse 32, he shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. Uh, look at the rest of the verse, because it kind of lines up with what we've already talked about. Um, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. We already saw that he was the son of David. Uh, the title's not used here, but the title's used here. All right, he shall be called the son of the highest. Um, Again, you used to teach English. When you teach English, you've got your, your, your uh, degrees of comparison. And when you have your ESTs, your, your superlatives, that narrows the entire discussion to one. He is the son of not a high one. He is the son of the highest. Not of a higher one, the highest. The entire discussion narrowed down to one. And it's interesting. Why does it say that? Why didn't it just say he's called the son of God? We already saw that. That title's used, right? Uh, again, not incredibly profound thought. I was thinking the connection between Jesus and Jehovah is secure, it's locked in. He is the son of the one and only one. He is divine. And what's it telling us here? He is the son of the highest. Or he is the son of the most exalted one. Um, if I really wanted to make the sentence, he is the son of the, of the most highly exalted one. He is the son of the most highly esteemed, the highly exalted one. I mean, think, he is the son of God. And, and the thoughts here are pretty profound today, okay? You probably caught up. In, let, me, let me restate this. Jesus is God. He's making it incredibly clear. In this case, you've got the angel talking to Mary, making incredibly clear that Jesus Christ is God. And he is... And, and, God is the highest, so he's the son of the highest, which means that he is the, has the very nature of, he is God over all gods. We mentioned already, the Greek and Romans, uh, they're gods, that's a, that's a, uh, a figment of your imagination, okay? They're, they're, their gods were made up. they made for good stories. Um, Jesus was not made up. He is God. He is God Almighty. He is God over all gods. The next that we have here is uh, the beloved son, or my beloved son. Um, Let's go to Matthew 3. We'll look at both of these, I think. Matthew 3. Matthew 3 and verse 17. This is following, we talked about John, baptized Jesus. This is following the baptism. Verse 17, last verse in this chapter. Um, Verse 16, Jesus is baptized, went up out of the water. Look at verse 17, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. All right, Uh, this voice from heaven, Paul had that voice from heaven, right? We talked, saw Paul in his conversion in Acts chapter 9. That voice from heaven. And he knew exactly what was taking place, who was there. Here, we have this voice from heaven. How many heard this voice? Couldn't tell you, it doesn't tell us. It simply says there was a voice from heaven. And here's what the voice said. Go to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Being in Mark chapter 12, it's probably not the baptism of Jesus. Uh, Mark chapter 12 and verse 6. Let's see if I have that right. I'm not sure I do. Uh, and, to be honest, I don't remember what it's supposed to be. Um, Mark chapter 12 is probably dealing with the transfiguration, if I had to take a guess where they have the transfiguration, and you have that same idea. 
that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Um, meaning here doesn't change. I uh, saw that in Matthew. The father declared that Jesus was his son and more. He wasn't just my son. This is my beloved son. We saw already that father-son relationship, the unique love that's there. Uh, and again, we've talked about relationship. Go back to the introduction. Names and titles show relationship. Uh, how about this one? Does it show a relationship? Oh, absolutely it does. And it's interesting here that the father was pleased with the son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Um, as Jesus lived and died, as he went about his life on this earth, everything that he did, he pleased the father. Uh, think back to when he was but a child. And Mary and Joseph were scurrying around trying to find him because he wasn't in the company of the people. And he's back and he's talking to the doctors and lawyers at the temple. And he says, don't you know I'm supposed to be about my father's business? What, what his goal in life, his purpose in life was to do the will of the father. And in doing the will of the father, he pleased God. The father was pleased with him. And we as well should live in such a way that we seek to please the Father. That should be the desire of our hearts, that we please Him. And then the last one that we'll see today, um, the only begotten Son. Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We spent some time in John chapter 3 looking at the Son and the Son of God. Here we find in verse 3, uh, verse 16, which may be the most familiar verse in the entirety of Scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. But he, again, narrowed down the entire scope here. It wasn't simply his son. It was his only son. Well, it was his only begotten son. His gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 we looked at, verse 36 we looked at, and we'll see those same ideas throughout there. Verse 18 talks about the Son of God. Uh, but his only begotten Son, Jesus is unique. He is a one and only. Okay? Uh, he's the only begotten Son of God. And it's important to understand that. That, that, that carries great importance in today's world here in 2024. Uh, he's the only begotten Son of God, and he has the very same nature as God. Uh, go over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. We'll read the uh, few verses here, 5 through 10, 5 through 11. Uh, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Okay, he had the very nature of God because he was God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. No one else has that ability. But made himself of no reputation. He became the son of man. And took upon him in the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and notice this next clause, given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee, uh, every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The importance of the name of Christ, as is mentioned here, and we look at this is one who had the very form of God, didn't think there was any issue with that because he was God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was God. He humbled himself and became a man and died that we could have the opportunity for salvation. There is a lot tucked into this handful of verses. A lot tucked in here. He is the very nature of God. We see as we look at this that he is the only begotten son of God. There is none like him. If he is the only begotten, how many are there? Uh, I can't afford to buy antiques, but I like looking at antiques. And I, I collect a few things, but I don't buy really what are really considered collectibles. 
Collectibles means there's a limited number. Uh, the more limited the number, the higher the value, which means the higher the price. Um, the higher the value. Um, sometimes it'll say one of however many thousand. But what if it's one of one? I mean, think about that for a second. One of one means that you can't put a price tag on it. And we can't put a price tag on Jesus Christ. He is the only begotten one. There is none like him. And I mentioned a little bit just a few minutes ago, that's really important because while we can become the sons of God, and it's a term that's used in Scripture, that doesn't mean that we are like Jesus, where we are God's. That means we're in the family of God, but we're not God's. And that's important because there are some groups that claim to be Christian that believe that we can become God's just like Jesus is God. We can become the sons of God. Well, you need to know the title, but you need to understand what the title means. And the simple fact that you choose to redefine it doesn't change how God defined it. He is God, and there is none like him. And when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, and we become the sons of God, uh, we're not the equal of Jesus Christ. Well, conclusion. Um, conclusion is really short today. Um, all the different forms of son help us to fill in our understanding of who he is, who Jesus Christ is, how he relates to the Father, Keep in mind that we have one God and how he relates to us. We saw in a couple of different places here, we saw it in Acts 4.12, we saw it in John chapter 3, the only way to get to heaven is through the Son. There's no way to get to heaven except through him, but by him. There's no way. Jesus Christ in, in uh, John 14 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father. Now think of it. No man. What kind of exceptions are there? Okay, there's no exception. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay, nobody can get to heaven except this one way. There are no exceptions on the people, no exceptions on the, on the way. He's pretty clear about that. Eternal life comes only through Jesus Christ. Um, Matthew 16, 16. Uh, go ahead and turn there. Matthew 16, 16. Uh, this passage, the confession of Peter. Jesus is talking. They're in the... Uh, was it the coast of, of Caesarea Philippi. And he says, Whom do men say, notice the title, that I the Son of Man am? Who do men say that I am? And they, they answered the question. Some say that you're John the Baptist, some say that you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah. Jesus asks another question. Okay, what do you think? Who am I? And Peter, who was never afraid to speak up, Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now that title may show up next week. The Son of God, but there's that additional modifier there. The Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the, son, the name. Who do you think this Jesus is? And that's a question that every man has to answer. Everybody has to deal with that particular question. Who do you say that I am? The one who has rejected Christ throughout his entire life stands before him at judgment, and Christ says, so who do you think I am? Uh, at that point, he knows the answer. <laughs> and he knows that's not what he, th what he thought before. Uh, John 3, 36. Uh, we've been in the passage a couple times. Let's go ahead and go back there. John 3, verse 36. John chapter 3. If you are looking for a focus for a Bible study or devotional time this week or in the coming week, go through this chapter and look at the different times that the word son 
is mentioned and see how it's used. We mentioned already uh, John 3, 16, only begotten Son. Verse 17, we just referred to as we went through the passage, but for God sent not his Son. Look at verse 18, we mentioned that one, the only begotten Son of God. And then we went down to verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not, not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If we don't receive the Son, it's not simply that, well, I can choose what. If we reject the Son, God's wrath, his punishment, is deemed out, uh, dealt out to us. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have the promise of eternal life. If you reject the Son, you have the promise of eternal death and destruction. The wrath of God abideth on him. Now, they're not in the notes, but I did pull a, a, a couple of songs, hymns and songs, dealing with the Son of God. And that's a hard one to look up. Um, it's just a challenge. Uh, first of all, uh, there is a Redeemer. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, kind of written the very first line. Uh, and it goes through and talks about the fact that Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, is our Redeemer. Uh, fairest Lord Jesus. Uh, the anonymous text that was, comes from Latin. I think, it was, I think it was translated from Latin, or maybe it's from a German hymnal a bazillion years ago. I don't remember. But fairest Lord Jesus. And it talks about him being the Son of God. Um, o Come, O Come, Emmanuel, Christmas song. And it talks about the Son. Uh, because He Lives, a song that was more familiar a few years ago, written by, uh, by the Gaithers, uh, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow, talks about the fact that, hey, God's very own Son. I mean, there, are, there are a number of them. And then, uh, uh, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, uh, a little bit more modern hymn. Um, there are songs there. It's, just, it's a challenge to look up, and the phraseology isn't used a lot in, in the text of songs in him, but there are some. That as you think about it throughout the week, you can think of those, these songs and think about the fact that Jesus Christ is more than just a man. He was man, but he was far more than that. He was indeed God, very God. He was the Son of God, had the very nature of God, and it is through that Jesus Christ through his name that eternal life is promised to us. And that is the only way that we can have eternal life. And I think that's the last note on there. Yep. Um, and so there's a, a decent chance that we'll have a few more uh, son titles next week. Um, he's, he's the son of Adam. He was representative of the entire human race. That one wasn't in the notes today. And so there's, uh, there's a, a few more son titles titles that uh, maybe we'll use and look at those next week. But Jesus Christ, the Son, the Son of God, uh, the Messiah. Uh, continuing, before I wrap up, I'd mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, I am here next week and then gone for the two weeks following. If anybody's interested in teaching the class, you can see me or you can see the gentleman that just walked into the back of the auditorium. Uh, otherwise, the class will get rolled into one of the others for, for a couple of weeks. So um, if anybody's interested, let us know, and uh, we'll go from there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and graciousness. God, thank you for giving us the ability to study your word, to read it, to learn it, to know it. Father, to learn more about your son, Jesus Christ, uh, who he is, the relationship that's there between the father and the son, the relationship that's between the father, the son, and us. Help us to put our faith and trust in him that we might have eternal life. And we ask this in your name, amen. Have a great day.